another exciting episode of the Magic Sandwich Show, number 59. And we are, uh, for the second time, using uh, Google Hangouts, uh, which I think means that you should be watching us either on YouTube or, alternatively, on our website, www.magicsandwichshow.com. If you go to that website um, and click on Live Stream, uh, you should be able to see us there. And I'll be keeping an eye on the messages that are posted in that chat room. And I think Owen is keeping an eye on those that are posted on to YouTube. So welcome, everyone. And it's a great pleasure to um, welcome two of the backbones, I suppose, so to speak, of the show who have been with us from the get-go, uh, Aaron Ra and Thunderfoot. It's also very exciting yeah. because we have um, someone who should be joining us shortly. Um, he is from Pakistan. I understand that he is a Muslim, and he has several questions about um, evolution that he wants to raise. So uh, that should be quite fun. I'm not sure why he's not with us at the moment, but he has promised that he will be with us uh, shortly. If you would like to join the show and talk about any of the issues that we're discussing or have any questions of your own, please send a Skype contact request to... Oh, I forgot what it is. Magic, sorry. Magic Sandwich Show, all one word, on Skype. Uh, if you do so, please include the gist of the topical question you'd like to ask. What will happen then is I will send you a URL. All you'll need to do is click on that, and then you will be brought into uh, the Hangout. So there we go. But seeing as we're waiting for our friend from Pakistan, we're going to start off uh, discussing Thunderfoot's latest video, which he posted today, and I thought was absolutely fantastic. Thunder, for the benefit of those who have not seen it, uh, give us the gist of it. Well, uh, I've known for some time that Conservapedia has got some really crazy stuff on it. Um, and in fact, I've known about some of this crazy stuff. It goes back to Don Exodus 2. He actually first clued me into it. It had some really crazy stuff on there about uh, Noah's Flood. And so I was looking over it, and I come across this suggestion that animals, um, small animals, um, could have been dispersed after Noah's flood great distances, far farther than they could get by walking by volcanoes in the Mount Ararat region. Um, and you really don't have to think about it long to think, that's bloody crazy. Um, I mean, the most obvious thing is, we have volcanoes today. And when the volcanoes today explode, you don't get small fluffy creatures raining down hundreds of miles away. They basically kill everything where it stands. Um, you know, with a variety of pyroclasts, asphyxiating gases, um, landslides, and so forth. And maybe the easiest one to put it into perspective is the V-2 rocket in World War II. Um, they went on ballistic trajectory. That is, after a powered launch, it flies on an unpowered trajectory. Um, so this is basically the trajectory that your small fluffy animals would have to follow if they were getting to get thrown great distances by volcanoes. And the V2 only had a range of about a couple of hundred miles, which really isn't further than you can get by walking. And even at that, for that ballistic trajectory, you've got to get up into space, like much higher than the Felix, what was his name, the guy who did the free fall from space. Felix, whatever. Um, he only jumped from like... It was a multi-syllabled surname. I'm sure we can yeah. find it. But. So Felix only jumped from like 40 kilometers to... Um, the V2s came in from about 100 kilometers. And if you would get a ballistic trajectory that would take you much further than merely the few hundred miles that the V2s went, you need to spend, it turns out, almost an hour in space. So... Um, this creation idea is just so outrageously crazy. But the stupid thing is, whilst actually going over this, um, just I came across loads more equally batshit crazy creationist stuff. Um, and it's just jaw-dropping how, uh, in order to get reality to fit with their biblical perspective, just how um, 
uh, cavalier they have to be with um, with science and reality. It really is impressive. Anyway, so I, another thing that I um, I meant to look up, um, unfortunately I didn't have time to do so, was exactly how long um, Noah's flood lasted for, because people have this. Uh, incorrect assumption that it lasted for 60 days and 60 nights. That was just the rain. I think if you add up um, or the entire time, uh, I've done it before, I think it's about um, 13 months. Um, That's almost exactly right. Yeah. Um, so if you go by what biblical scholars say, um, or I'll turn to what the Bible says, uh, it's just over a year. Just over a year. Uh, which, if you think about it, um, most plants will die if they're just completely submerged in water. The idea that any plant life would have survived having been underwater for uh, a year is just crazy. The planet would be completely dead um, to the point where it's doubtful whether, even if Noah had got off the ark, if you get off on a dead planet, um, you, you know, all the things like the carbon cycle, they've all gone, right? You, you've just got um, an almost non-existent population on the planet. Um, and you have all the other problems, like just say, for instance, you did bring two lions off the ark. Um, what are they going to eat for the next... Uh, 10 or 15 years. Uh, well, Concordance now has a baby lion, which is clearly of cat kind. Well, no, so maybe it's, we it's, can a ask cat, it's, it's a cat kind. I think, according to Venom X's definitions, it would be a small cat kind, which is obviously unrelated to a large cat kind. Can Concordance hear us? I don't know. I, he, he seems to be dumb. I don't <laughs> know whether it's dumb uh, by visitation of God or by malice. Um, but... Um, We'll come back to him shortly. Uh, I, I can't see why he wouldn't be able to hear this. Uh, I think it's a problem at his end. Mm -hmm. He seems quite content with his, his cat, though. But one of the things that you mentioned, Thunder, was amongst, in this video, was, amongst other things, was the fact that uh, volcanoes are put forward as a serious explanation for the distribution of the animals. What I would like you to address is why is it that these volcanoes worked in such a magnificent way that all the kangaroos ended up in Australia, all the penguins on the South Pole, and all the polar bears on the North Pole. How, do, how does that work? And even better than that, um, there's all these... Uh, islands are notorious for having peculiar flora and fauna, which is essential because they're isolated, pocket, isolated gene pools. Um, so you get things like Galapagos tortoises, the finches, um, the marine iguanas, you get all these crazy sort of um, life that happens on islands and only on the islands. Um, and so how did this post-flood dispersal of the animals result in such a, a, a crazy whatever? Um, yeah, in many ways, I don't see why the creationists don't have such a problem with saying, well, yeah, it's God. He did it by magic. But then again, if he could do it all by magic, why actually bother with the melodrama of the flood in the first place? You know, why not just sort of banish all the bad people? Why not? Why not forgive everyone? I don't know. Um, actually, that was one of the ones I came across. This is, this is actually on. <clears throat> Dugan, yeah. It's one of the ones I came across. Was I think it was. It was either Ray Comfort or Ken Ham going on about how the flood was so important because it was God showing uh, you know, judgment and kindness. And it's like, uh, uh, no, it was an act of, if you believe the story, which of course none of us do, but if you did, it's an act of capricious genocide. You know, the idea that, in fact, there's an animation that comes from the Creation Museum. Um, and, you know, it's got all these, uh, it's an animation of the flood, and there's this huge tsunami coming in that's like two kilometers tall or something, and there are these little kids playing some sort of board game, and it's like, 
yeah, those little kids playing board game, they were really part of a sinful earth. They really deserve to die. And this is actually part of the video um, in the Creation Museum, which is crazy. Sorry, oh, um, I, I was trying to multitask. Owen, do go on. I didn't say anything. Oh, well, I, d I, I had a question for Thunder, because um, the, 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 what you were referring to comes from the pages of Creationpedia, um, and um, it seemed, from what you were suggesting in your video, that these were creation scientists that were advancing this theory. Um, what can you tell us about creation scientists? Do you actually know of any? Do they are they named? Do they have peer-reviewed publications or what? Well, yeah, I mean, they. Uh, I think frequently um, are what you would call cargo cult scientists. Um, and the most obvious example of this is a guy called Pendleton, um, who I I forgot his first name. But you must have seen his videos, and you can tell his videos because he wears a lab coat in them, and he wears a lab coat to show that he's a scientist. Um, and the crazy thing is, scientists almost never wear lab coats. Um, so actually, if, if you if you've ever watched a, a, a YouTuber named um, Logic, he does a beautiful job on Pendleton, uh, who apparently is an auto mechanic. He uh, <laughs> does oil changes, uh, and he's, he's not afraid to admit that, but he's still wearing the lab coat because he's, he's a creation scientist. He hasn't, I mean, he, I think he majored in biology or chemistry at some point in, in college, but now he, he does oil changes. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's a, it's an honorable profession, but it doesn't really qualify you to but it, you know, challenge the scientific consensus. It is just hilarious, though, that you know somewhere in his mind he's got the idea that to be a scientist you've got to wear a lab coat. It's like you're making <laughs> well, a, a clean one too, a very yeah, a, shiny white one. Yeah, a, a virgin lab coat. Yeah, uh, it's <laughs> that like, you never see. It's a little uh, bit like Ian Juby, isn't it? He feels that he's yeah. got to wear something that makes him look safari like a, hat. Yeah, a geologist or whatever. Right. Um, right. So yeah, I mean, they've got this sort of laundry list of th you know, scientists don't wear lab coats when they're talking to a camera, unless they're right. in a lab. You know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so it's this sort of cargo cult, and the cargo cult. Um, uh, meme comes from uh, World War Two, I think, when uh, the Pacific War was going on. The Americans would come to these scarcely populated islands, uh, set up air bases, and basically uh, just use them to ship stuff on. And the natives didn't really understand any of this, and you know, in many ways saw the uh, U.S. Air Force as gods. Because you know, and they bought in all sorts of things that they'd never seen before, um, and of course, after the war, they all left. And you get these sort of cargo cults where these natives have set up things that look like airports, and you know, so they've they've associated airports um, with the sky people bringing things to them, and so they've sort of set things up like that in the hope that. If they look like the U.S. Air Force, then they will become the U.S. Air Force, or that sort of thinking. And it's the same with the creation scientists. They think that just by putting on a lab coat and maybe calling themselves doctor every now and again, that, that makes them a scientist. And of course, scientists are defined by what they do, not by what they call themselves or what they wear. And Richard Feynman did a, a lovely essay. I, I did a reading of it. I have a video on it. Uh, that's where he, he's the one who popularized the term cargo cult science to describe pseudoscientists who have all the trappings of science but not the core philosophy of being critical and self-skeptical and, and you know examining the facts with an objective eye. They just sort of have all the, the trappings of it without the core philosophy. It, it doesn't, doesn't work. Well, I had to open the program cap, by, by the way. saying, sorry, I, um, I'd opened the program by saying that we were going to have um, someone from Pakistan call in to ask questions about uh, evolution. Um, he said he was going to join us. He appears to be offline now, but um, I, I got a message he, from him. 
Uh, yeah, he, and, uh, and I think he posted ten questions. And well, sorry. seven really. Seven. Um, I'm yeah. sorry, he he, li- he numbered them one through ten, but he repeated two of them, and one of them he repeated twice. Okay, well, shall God, we, it's shall just like through? dealing with Nephilim free again. <laughs> yeah. Um, shall we? Shall we take them one at a time? And I can, perhaps I can invite you to read out the question, and then we'll. Uh, All right. Give, give me give me one second. Just just stall for a moment. I'm going to try to uh, to get a to get a link to this guy so we can at least listen to the show if he can't join us. Uh, bear with well, me. I've, just I've, I've, I've just messaged him on or tried to message him on Skype. He is offline at the moment. He was online. Um, uh, oh, oh no, that's not him. Well, Sorry. no, he's that's... still online here. Oh, okay. Well, see if you can message him. Um, he says he says he needs another hour until he gets electricity again. Ooh. Well, so I don't know how he posted on, that. How... He must be on battery power. Yeah. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Although okay. you know, it's one of those things that if you live in a country with a sporadic electricity supply. Well, I suppose yeah, we can. Be, I, su- yeah. I suppose we can address the questions well enough. I mean, I did I did happen to copy them down. Question number one, why didn't all apes evolve into humans? We know that evolution occurs without any prejudice, and I, I, I'm going to guess that the problem here is that English is not his first language, and I don't know what he means by evolution occurring with or without prejudice. I can't understand that question, but why didn't all apes evolve into humans? The best way, and I'm going to have to refer to this a number of times in my explanation, to understand evolution for so, for those who don't understand it and don't understand it, that it is it is at the population level is to draw an analogy with the evolution of language and the most classic example that most people I think understand pretty well and can easily relate to is um, Latin which is now an extinct language that emerged in or that, that eventually transformed into Italian and also branched into Romanian, French, Spanish, and then on to Portuguese and so on. Evolution occurs in biology uh, in a similar fashion to the way that languages evolve. So when you ask the question, why didn't all apes evolve into humans, you can look at that analogously to uh, why didn't Latin only translate into or only transform into Italian you know why are there other languages because evolution is an explanation of biodiversity it's how different groups branch off and that's why you have several different languages emerging uh, similarly why didn't we we know for a fact that uh, that modern dogs are domestic dogs all were derived from Asiatic wolves so why didn't all wolves turn into dogs Obviously, we're having a an emergence of specific mutations that are selected for either artificially or or naturally in a given environment or under g- given circumstances to derive a new variant. As I said, uh, evolution is biodiversity, so it's producing new and different kinds. It's not a ladder. It's not an ascension. It is not a linear situation. Uh, brief explanation. Now, the, the next question should go relatively fast. Question number two. Humans lived in jungles too, like apes do, and have been living in a similar environment in many areas of Africa. Why don't we see an ape becoming more like a human there? Actually, Um, Aaron, can I can I just inject one last point? Sure. um, On that last, I've always liked the analogy that um, uh, if Americans if if Americans are descended from Europeans, then why are they still Europeans? Right, and then the Protestant religions also branched off of Catholicism, so why are there still Catholics? I, I, think, I think the language analogy, and I know that you're going to return to it, I think it's a very good one, um, because I think it's useful, and I, I don't want to uh, anticipate what you're going to say, but I suspect, in relation to one of the questions, I'm not sure it was the first one or not, um, it's very difficult to say when, when do you say that Italian has become Romanian or... Spanish has become Portuguese. Right. Um, There was no. A friend of mine was studying uh, ancient languages, and she was reading Don Quixote in the original, you know, non-translation, the original text. And she said that you know she speaks Latin, she speaks Spanish, and here reading Don Quixote from you know 1500 year old document, it is both. 
it's 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 making a transition from Latin, from Latin into Spanish. You couldn't call it modern Spanish, and yet neither is it you know fully Latin. And so when you when you talk about like Ray Comfort and his example of the first dog, right? Uh, his analogy is that you had some guy who was walking around unable to speak to anybody ever, and then suddenly he speaks French, and he has to go find a mate who also speaks French so that he has somebody he can talk to. These people are deliberately distorting information as much as they possibly can because they are trying very hard not to understand simple concepts. So in this guy's question, question one and question two are in fact the same question repeated. Why didn't all, all apes evolve into humans? And then he asks the same question again, paraphrase, why don't we see an ape becoming more human-like there? So out of his 10 questions, the first, the first two are in fact the same. So we're dropped down to, uh, what is it, eight now? Uh, in the next question, question number three, why in the history of more than 10,000 years don't we get an example of any ape turning human or closer to human well, now we've got a, a third, a second repeat of the same question again. So the, the number of questions for the atheists has uh, dwindled a bit, and I don't need to give another answer. Now, number, number four, he had to ask twice. And again, this may be because English might not be his first language, but the way that he phrased it the first time made no sense at all. He had to paraphrase it, and he paraphrased a completely different question. The way that he phrased it the first time was important, star, star, star. Uh, just like you atheists ask for live proof of God, I ask you for a live proof of any fossil showing that both apes and humans were evolving at typical time of that fossil. That, that I, yeah. I have to say, Owen, I, I, th I think we must be um, sympathetic. I think that English isn't his first language. I read that question. Uh, yeah. I didn't understand it. I, I believe yeah. that he sort of like rephrased it. Right. Well, he did rephrase it, and I, and I copied the paraphrase. It said, I asked for a fossil which proves that humans and apes have common links. Although we have a few primate fossils, of them is evidence enough to prove them right. What we're looking for first is not the fossils, because you got to remember that Darwin, compo Darwin composed his theory with virtually no fossil evidence behind it. He was relying, as you know, Carolus Linnaeus was 300 years earlier, not on any fossil evidence whatsoever. Linnaeus was a creationist. Linnaeus had no concept of evolution whatsoever. But he, uh, he laid out a challenge for the scientific community to show one diagnostic trait by which to distinguish humans from apes, because he could not find one. He examined orangutans, he examined chimpanzees, he said that they were subspecies of humans, and that humans were, therefore, within the category of apes. And taxonomically, we are apes. So to find something that is half ape and half human is exactly the same thing as finding something that is half duck and half bird, or half ant and half insect. The, the, the question doesn't even make any sense. Now, there are some people that arbitrarily created a separate uh, category, which wasn't really a legitimate category. In response to Carolus Linnaeus' challenge, the, his contemporaries created a, a taxonomic category for all the non-human apes, and they called that Pongo. And that's where the orangutans and the gorillas and the chimpanzees were. And then they, they actually put in a further definition that the word ape should apply only to extant non-human apes. And I think further, they, at some point, they tried again, arbitrarily, to limit that to only those apes that are still alive today and living in Africa and excluding the ones living in Asia. Well, of course, with all these arbitrary rules, it gets very confusing as to what an ape exactly is. And uh, a little over a decade ago, we finally had uh, a phylogenetic analysis revealing that we are genetically apes. We are not just morphologically apes, as Linnaeus recognized 300 years ago. The genes show that we are apes also. The fossil record also shows things that morphologically would have been recognized or identified as apes. All of our common ancestors would have been apes. We are a subset of the ape group, just as birds are a subset of dinosaurs and therefore are still dinosaurs now. 
uh, and I'm sorry that I had to get so detailed on this, but I have to explain some things. Then, uh, in, in, as far as the, the missing links go, I explain this in the ninth foundational falsehood of creationism. About halfway through, I start giving a list of the very things that our, uh, our Pakistani guest or would-be guest was asking for. There is a relatively complete list that, uh, that that video came out four or five years ago. There have actually been additions to that. Uh, it's not just that we it's not that we've run a dearth of them. It's not that we're lacking any. The problem actually is that we have too many of them. And creationism cannot account for any of these. Evolution can, but it gets a little confusing when we have so many different quasi-human ape ancestors from that concordant time. Now, uh, it, his question four was repeated in question five, so again, we, we, we have a repeat, a second, it's basically we've got two questions, one repeated twice and one repeated once. It says, why isn't a fossil like that available? The answer is, fossils like that are available. There are many, many of them. As a matter of fact, I think the minimum number of individuals that had been found a decade ago numbered over 4,000 and I have no idea how many that they found. I know there's been a half a dozen new species identified just in the hominid fossil line since then. I don't know how many more or additional individuals that accounts for. Question number six. Why is it that the evolutionists have largely abandoned the idea that human evolution was linear even though the alternative doesn't help them either? Is it because it leaves them with a whole lot of unconnected fossils? Uh, again, the answer assumes something that is not accurate. It, it, evolution was never linear. Not Darwinian evolution, anyway. If you were talking to, to like Aristotle or, or um, Anaximander, they might have thought that there was a linear progression, but they had very limited in, knowledge of the rest of the world. Darwin. There is also a presumption. Uh, uh, yes. There is also a presumption of intentions in there, uh, and science really doesn't have an agenda like that. Well, if it, science does have an agenda, it's to actually um, produce theories, produce models that actually accurately represent reality. That is yes. the goal. There is no sort of um, uh, desire here. To th th there is no agenda. We're not trying to create an explanation that doesn't involve God. We're actually just trying to create an explanation that actually accurately describes reality. There right. is no agenda here. And so the yep. question presumes the agenda. Is it because you just don't want, you know, because it'll leave you with a load of unrelated fossils? No, it's a good model because it explains what we observe, and it can be used predictively to explain things we have not yet observed. Yeah, the, the summary is that with religion uh, you are to preserve or maintain a particular belief regardless what the facts turn out to be, and the agenda of science is only to improve understanding, and that of course means that you have to question all your prior assumptions and test them. Uh, getting into the next question, let's see, uh, oh, oh, we have, haven't finished this one yet. I wanted to mention that, when it, again, going back to the uh, analogy of language, that the transition from Latin to Italian could be said because they're the same people living in the same area. They've always been there. So the language has transitioned from Latin directly into Italian, and that would be anagenesis, and that would be what you could describe as linear. But most evolution is cladogenesis, which is where you also get French and Spanish and Portuguese and Romanian and so on. So, uh, question number seven, why do none of the ape fossils shows enough human features for evolutionists to say without a doubt that this is the point where the ape turned human or a primitive human fossil showing it is related to apes? Okay, all human fossils and indeed all extant living human beings are still plainly related to apes. We're related to them genetically, related to them morphologically. When you try to categorize the body of what is an ape, um, you have to describe it by all the traits that are universally accepted or that are common to every, every example that is already universally accepted as part of that set uh, without making exceptions for certain ones. 
If you have inherited the traits for the, these criteria and then lost them, that can be accounted for. That's why snakes that once had legs, we know this from fossil record of whales that once had legs, are still listed as tetrapods. Uh, it's very easy to see, without having to make many exceptions, that humans are still within the subgroup of, of apes. Uh, and that's the living ones. All the fossil ones also meet this criteria. So there's a, a number of diagnostic traits there. Uh, so all of the ape fossils show enough human features. There, it, it, as a matter of fact, the word ape, and, it, and that's the next question. Uh, question number eight says, if atheists believes humans and apes have a common ancestor, why do they call that ancestor an ape too? Don't it have a scientific name? Yes, it does. The scientific name for all of apes is hominoidea, which of course is Latin for humanoid and when you want to get into the subset the a subset of hominoid we need to divide the lesser apes and the great apes the great apes are in the class of hominidae which is another subclass of humanoids and of course uh, hominine are further more human like so the next question I think we're on to the next question now no we're not uh, question number seven and I may have skipped one no, I did get that one. All right. So question number eight was, so what is the Latin name? And question number nine, do you possess a fossil proof of your common ancestor? This is yet another quest, a repeat of question number four with, of course, the same answer. So his ten questions, I think, really works out to about four questions in total so far. And then we get a fifth question, which is, don't you all admit what Karl Popper said Darwinism is not a testable scientific theory, but a metaphysical research program. If you look at it from this perspective, your claim is no different than the claim of believers. Okay. First, it doesn't matter what Karl Popper or uh, can, anybody uh, so, else First of all, can, can, can you just explain to me what a metaphysical research program is? I can. Please I do. Mean, it, it, Popper is talking about the philosophy of science, and I'm a big fan. Um... The fact is that you cannot falsify the entire evolutionary program with a single finding. You know, we talk about like fossil bunnies in the Precambrian as a single finding that would falsify all of evolution, but that's not really true. At this point, evolution has become robust enough that it would require extensive evidence to overturn it. That is, it has become, when they say metaphysical, it's become part of the knowledge base and not a fact unto itself, right? It, it's sort of the lens through which biology makes sense. So when we say metaphysical yeah. research program, we're talking about it no longer really being in doubt or in question, right? And so we're not attempting to falsify evolution anymore. Yeah, but they're, they're, but this, this would be the equivalent of saying that... Um, a spherical Earth is, um, you know, no longer questioned because it's so robust that it explains all the observations about night and then the movement. Of the yeah, planet. but there, there's so, a bit more. There's a bit more muddiness in the Karl Popper quote because uh, it's clear. Um, this is the one thing that I had to look up when I looked at the at the list of supposedly ten questions, which are really only five. Um, the Karl Popper quote. It appear, It appears that he used the word Darwinism when he meant to refer to natural selection. Now, when we talk about Darwinian evolution as you know, exclusive of you know, Mendelian concepts or the modern synthesis, we are only talking about Darwin's suggestion of natural selection. And that's what Popper was talking about. And apparently later on in his same treatise he clarifies that he, or in, I think previously also, that he wasn't, he didn't mean by Darwinism, he wasn't talking about the whole of evolutionary theory. He was only talking about natural selection. And then he also used the wrong definition of that because he used Herbert Spencer's evolution of or uh, survival of the fittest and labeled that as Darwinism. And then later in the same document, he also mentioned, he goes back to referring to natural selection and states there that he was actually incorrect in the previous usage. So there's an article written on this where they take the quotations from uh, Natural Center or National Center for Science Education. Uh, you look up NCSC and really pretty much you can put in the Karl Popper quote and that'll take you right to their article and they show you what he really said 
and in the context what was the only thing he could have meant based on the various things that he said there. So this is another out of context quote mine from something that was not phrased very well and was misinterpreted by the people who read it. Now, now, I, I, I don't think that you want to reinterpret, sorry, cat problem. I don't think you want to reinterpret what Popper was trying to say, which was, and by the way, he renounced this later, uh, even just a few years later, as saying basically evolution is unfalsifiable. But it's unfalsifiable for reasons that have to do with its scope, just how large a an explanatory framework it is, in the same sense that we would probably say that atomic theory uh, is no longer a falsifiable concept because oh, we I have mean, taken it so far that it's, it's no longer realistic to say we've, we've falsified atomic theory. Right? Things aren't really I, made of atoms. The Sorry. one that I would go for would be um, uh, the uh, heliocentric solar system. Uh, you know, it, it's gone so far that, you know, how could you falsify it? Um, it's so powerfully um, descriptive of what we observe that how would you actually falsify it? It's very much like this, I and mean, creationists don't understand this. I mean, what, what, what Thunder was saying about you know, being equivalent to atomic theory, that's correct. If you got somebody that was not in any remotely educated background, if they're, they're very backwoods, very rural, um, they're not going to understand atomic theory. They're not going to understand why the Bohr's model is not accurate, yet we teach right. it anyway, none of that right. sort of thing. But it, when, when you're talking about young earth creationism, which is an, an extreme within an extreme, Mm -hmm. um, it really is just this silly. This isn't even an analogy. This really is just this silly. That you have somebody that walks into a, uh, a, a, a pediatric clinic and starts berating the obstetrician for his refusal to, to teach both sides with respect to the stork theory. It's really that dumb. Or I should say that unrealistic. And incidentally, the uh, the person that derived these questions or that, that came up with these and was uh, and actually considered that this would be a challenge, put in a reference uh, to a creationist website where, that suggests that if humans evolved from apes, which humans evolved from which apes? And so it goes into an automatically racist statement to assume that there are different demographics of humanity that all emerge from different collectives within the apes. So I, I, I don't know what they're trying to get at here, but this is anybody that looks at things like this, I have to stress, and if the, if the person who, who composed these questions is listening, please hear this. Never, ever refer to a creationist website as a scientific source. It is not just that it is wrong. Because it's not making an innocent error. Okay, it's not that these people are, are are honestly ignorant. They are as wrong as they can possibly be on purpose, because the purpose of the creationist website is to make believe in the magical alternative, and to do that they have to criticize the scientific consensus. There is one global scientific consensus on this, and it's pretty secure. It is as secure as you know that that the earth is round it's just that solid and when the creationist websites are put together they try their very best to play on what people don't understand it is a very complex theory it requires a lot of study to understand it adequately and these people are taking advantage of the fact that not everybody gets it and they are misrepresenting it on purpose if you're turning to a creationist website as a source of information you are being lied to and you need to look at the legitimate scientific sources which will never say anything similar to what these creationist websites do. I, I suppose the point is, <coughs> excuse me, the point is this, Owen, for someone that doesn't have the ability to understand the scientific arguments, for someone that has no understanding of the uh, even the basics of evolution, um, what, what is the best way of getting the message across to these people? Um, obviously so like giving them a full education is not a, an option so what what advice would you have 
how do you how do you educate somebody in in something that requires so much study? It's not like when you look at the Bible that you have to have a seminary degree in order to understand. Well, I mean, in some degrees it is, because when you get that seminary degree, they have this uh, this saying that you know people don't come out of seminary school and still believe in God. So maybe to really understand it, maybe maybe it does require that level of study, but to understand to understand evolution. It's really not that hard to figure out if you get what it actually is at the onset. Everybody understands that the first dachshund, right, was was derived from previously existing dogs. It's not like Ray Comfort said where the first dog was blind for millions of years and now he has eyes. Ray Comfort knows that the first dog was derived from something that already had eyes. It came from a wolf. Wolves have eyes. Humans like Andy Jack's argument, you know, where we wandering around in the jungles with no eyes, and then suddenly we developed eyes. No, he knows that we did, that that we descended from apes, and that apes had eyes, and that you know that the apes came from the rhapsid mammals, and they had eyes. And so these people are very deliberately misrepresenting this as badly as they can in a, in a purposeful attempt to misunderstand in order to believe something that they know to be wrong. Otherwise. I note that there is someone uh, pressing under the comments on YouTube, which I'm trying to keep a track of uh, at the moment, um, going by the name of, well, I, I think he's probably best referred to now as he who shall not be named, um, <laughs> Jason Burns. Now, um, Jason, I think, is one of these people that is willfully ignorant, although I'm not sure uh, how willful his ignorance is. but. Um, he sh uh, I'm sorry, I should have said, he sh who shall not be named. Apparently, uh, won all of us so successfully uh, on the last show um, that he is now retired from YouTube because the War of the Roses, as he's described it, has been won by him. He's, he's won us all conclusively. Um, so he's, he retired from YouTube. Um, what's interesting, of course, retirement from YouTube for he who shall not be named means that he only posted 50 videos this week uh, on YouTube. But um, there we are. <laughs> so uh, he who shall not be named, who is apparently posting uh, in the chat, um, if you want to come and win us again, as you won us all um, last time, all you have to do, like anyone else who wants to join the show, is simply send a contact request to through Skype to Magic Sandwich Show, and we will see if you get it on. I've got one caller. Uh, that's it. So there's plenty of opportunity. Most people normally leave it to the second hour, uh, and then we get a, a, a influx of people. So book early to avoid disappointment. Had we dealt with all of this person's questions, or there was still one or two left to go? Nope, that was it. That that Karl Popper quote was the last one. You know, it's interesting. You can't argue with someone who is Did we lose? I I think I just I, I'm here. I'm terribly you just sorry. Muted I have me. To, I have Thanks to a lot. It's, it's, DPR. <laughs> It's, it's uh, the first time I've used this, and uh, thank you very much to um, sure. Naturalism, who has given me lessons in how to um, how to use this uh, Hangout system, and also um, the Pro Studio uh, system, which gives me the power to mute people, which means I, I feel the touch of Matt DeLahunty upon me. No, not like that. No, no, not like that. Um, but I think I just pressed the wrong button. I, I apologize, Concordance. Do carry on. So I've noticed that you cannot argue with someone who doesn't even understand the topic. And there's sort of an IQ minimum to have an intelligent discussion about these things. And it strikes me that many of the creationists are so profoundly ignorant of science that you can't make the points. So you spend all your time educating your opponent on the science and all they have to do is shake their head and you know suddenly you're looking very I don't know passive like you're on your heels like you're making excuses and you're saying no 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 you don't understand humans anatomically uh, you know genetically we are apes and here's why we're apes and it just doesn't it doesn't have the same strength of argument 
So Wait, what you have to do with I'm sorry, what, what you have to do with these people is to engage them. You have to ask mm -hmm. them questions that they provide the answers for. And that's the only way you'll get them to think because they have a, a system set up wherein they can explain everything by saying that's how God did it and that is a satisfactory answer for them. And all of the evidence you will ever present can be dismissed without a thought. They don't even have to have heard what you said. They just know that the sentence is completed and then they say, well, that doesn't prove anything. So they can remain utterly thoughtless without any concept at all and come away from the conversation victorious because they have not changed their mind and not understanding and not changing their mind and having no idea what you're talking about is perceived by them as a victory. So when you ask them the questions and force them to answer, this is when the, the behavior gets really erratic because they can't answer the questions. When my debate with Ray Comfort, for example, I asked him, okay, well, if you're, if you're, if anything that I suggest to you as a transitional species, you're going to say it doesn't count because, because, because. So you tell me what are the criteria that you would look for that would count and tell me why it would. And so he said, I wouldn't look for any because I would know that man was created by God. So you can't get, you can't ask them the question and have him answer it. The, the evasion of the answer will uh, will betray his actual motivations. He does not want to understand because understanding means to some degree belief and acceptance. Incidentally, Aaron, um, I came across um, whilst doing some scratching around on my latest video, um, a video of you and Eric Hoband when you were doing the protest. It was actually yes. on his channel. Um, and actually, no, it wasn't that. It was Ken Ham. And Ken Ham um, was apparently terribly offended that you called him an ape. Like, this was, you know, like devastatingly offensive for him. You know, and it was clear from the video that they had made that they thought this was simply a, a knockdown argument. You know, he called me an ape. Therefore, I'm not an ape. I win. It, it was... Really quite bizarre. You know, it's it's not just creationists that are like this. I, I've had discussions with anti-GMO protesters, and you have to take the time to explain to them that, say, a Roundup Ready, which is the most common GMO, does not mean that Roundup is inside the plant. And so you see these people that have prepared these signs that say, don't put pesticides inside my crops. And you have to take the time and say, that's, that's idiotic. I can't, I can't discuss with you because you don't even have a basic mastery of the topic. If I talk with HIV AIDS denialists, right, which they exist, if anyone doesn't know, HIV AIDS denialists, uh, they don't understand about viruses. If you talk with vaccine denialists, they don't understand how vaccines work. They don't understand what a mi you know microgram per liter means. What a, what what femtomolar means, right? These are concepts that you spend all your time having to explain, and that is why I honestly believe a lot of scientists simply do not feel any interest whatsoever in combating these crazy people, these science denialists, is because there's just we're not on equal footing. There's just it would take too long to educate people I'm, so that they can participate meaningfully in a real debate. I uh, agree. I agree completely. And uh, in many ways this is um yeah one of the problems is it's just such a thankless task. Um you know most people go into science, they do it because they're interested in uh, studying the unknown, finding out things that no one's known before. And you know, whilst it's true that um, you know, part of that is that you've got to educate the next generation so that they can have a sporting chance of doing the same thing. Um, and that does entail combating some of this pseudoscience. It is deeply... Um, dull work for exactly the reasons that you state. I mean, it's, uh, there are, um, I guess the, the the example that springs to mind is the creationists that we had this argument with a long time ago. It was one of Nephilim Free's friends. And, you know, they were arguing about nylonase enzymes. Um, and eventually, I just sort of, you know, had enough of this, and they said, do you actually know what an enzyme is? 
<laughs> they, they didn't know what enzymes were. They didn't know what proteins were. They didn't know what uh, you know how proteins were made. They knew nothing, right? They just they were just spouting out these words um, in almost, I guess, this sort of cargo cultish type thing. That you know, the number of people who actually understand these terms is not that many, and so all they have to do is spout the terms out, and they get the um, oh, what's he called? Um, uh, Kalan, what's he called? Uh, Craig, William Lane Craig effect. You know that if I put out enough smart-sounding words, people will think I know what I'm talking about. And it doesn't work that way with science. It is, um, you know, you you just end up looking like an idiot. And it's a very thankless task to sort of just go and disentangle where they've all got it wrong. Anyway, sorry. That's one of the reasons I mean, that's, that's why you just there are certain people I'm just not interested in participating in any kind of discussion with anymore. It, it, it's still kind of an outreach thing. There are still some people who I think, at the very least, you can correct some of their misconceptions. But someone like a Nephilim Free, right? The guy who, who <laughs> was telling me how dumb I am because I thought that uh, I, I confused retroviruses with retrotransposons when they are literally the same thing. It's literally a, a retrovirus is classified as a retrotransposon or transposable element. And again, like it's like playing chess with a pigeon, right? It, the best you can hope for, <laughs> they don't get a lot of shit on the board. Um, and with Nephilim Free, that was too much to hope. So anyway, I, Aaron, I just I just wanted to, to lead with that. You know, we have these discussions here with anyone who will show up on the show, but I never have any hope that we're going to make any progress on but. correcting misconceptions because it, the misconceptions are so deeply, deeply rooted in I ignorance actually, of science. I, I read the thread that was leading up to this one guy with his with his five questions that he thought added up to ten, and. His his misunderstanding is extremely basic, and I'm sure it's entirely environmental. And a lot of these people that, that we encounter, they may not have a lot of atheists in this world, and I suspect that in Pakistan there's probably not a lot of open conversation with atheists. About 1% you know, of the population. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it didn't look like there was going to be that much of a challenge, really, to set this guy straight, uh, as far backward as he wanted to be. And I was really hopeful that had we been able to get him onto the show that I would have been able to explain this. Well, the hopefully thing... we still will be able to get him on the show. Um, it's been about an hour. Hopefully his electricity supply um, will come back. Um, we're, we're more than ready to have him on, and we can go through this conversation again. Actually, um, I, I had... Uh, sorry, Thunder, if I just may uh, quickly say this. I had um, a caller lined up. Um, can I just explain? Um, the way to get on the show, send a Skype contract request to Magic Sandwich Show. I send you a URL. I will bring you into the show, but initially you will be invisible and muted. Uh, and unfortunately, I did have someone lined up. Um, he's disappeared because he's got internet connections. I've got a second person lined up, but um, just to make you aware of that fact, um, when you first come in, it's not that we're ignoring you. It's just that you are invisible. Uh, to the rest of the viewers, and we will come to you. Um, so uh, it seems as if we've lost concordance now as well, uh, and lost my camera. Goodness, what is what's happening? It's I only the second time we've used Google Hangouts. Um, so I, I just, uh, just as a matter of interest, before I come back to you, Thunder, um, I'm trying to keep tabs of comments in YouTube and also um, on the Magic Summer Show live feed. Um, just as a matter of interest, do you prefer this? set up. Uh, I know that we used to do it through Skype and stream a Skype call and um, I also keep you aware that Tony who was so helpful um, for all of those uh, years that we did it in that way for streaming um, is sort of like um, not, not party to it anymore and I, I feel somewhat bad about that. But we miss you Tony. Um, but you should come on as a panelist in future shows but just out of interest if people will let us know um, what they think about it and if we can't get the first caller back, I'll go on to the second caller. Thunder, you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, it was following on from what Concordance was saying, that you know you will never reach these people. And he's absolutely right. And if it was a question of just sort of trying to get these 
you know, die-hard science denialists to um, basically <laughs> accept that they don't really know what they're talking about. And what they think is a devastatingly clever argument is actually really more a demonstration that they don't really know what the hell they're talking about. Um, you know, if if that was the limit of the goal, you know, I would have uh, given up and gone home a long time ago. Um, the thing is that actually having these discussions in public um, is, I think, very informative for the the larger and saner portions of the population who are maybe a little more open uh, to you know who is who is who actually knows what they're talking about here and who is crazy. Um, and so that well, was... just was, I, I'm sorry, I thought you finished. I, I was just going to say that um, our friend from Pakistan has just come back online, and I oh, sent him the URL. So hopefully he'll be with us soon. Sorry, Thunder, I thought you'd finished. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, Although you always say yeah. that I interrupt you, and I don't yeah, always interrupt you. <laughs> I'm, I'm. Oh, hey, no, man. I don't always interrupt you, Thunder. <laughs> Okay. Right. Oh no, Thunder's got the power to mute me. I forgot. Oh no, that's I'm true. Sorry. Actually, I, I, I got the power to make. I got the power to make you disappear as well. Um, and Don't anyway, right. use it. Um, what? What I was going to say um, is, uh, yeah, it, it's for the same people. That's that's why you do the videos like why do people laugh at creationists you know the the number of die-hard creationists you're going to convince with this sort of thing uh, fairly small having said that I do get uh, messages on a fairly regular basis of people who say that you know, these videos were the pathway that took them from essentially being creationist to uh, non-religious so yeah, maybe they do get there. I, I don't know. I, I have a sneaky suspicion that um, people want to have answers and they're too lazy to actually... Um, and no, I, I, think that, I, think that's, I think that's unfair. That There are people who, if you like, have lived relatively insular lives. Um, and, you know, when they get online, it's... Yeah, it, it's good for them to go around and be able to see uh, broader perspectives. Uh, Mark, welcome to the show. I muted your microphone because there was a bit of background noise, but uh, if I know how to work this system correctly, you should now be unmuted. So welcome to the show, Mark. Hello, how are you doing today? We're doing well, thank you. Good. Actually, I was watching you guys talk about evolution. I uh, just got back from hanging out with a friend who is a biologist. He works in a lab, and uh, we actually had a conversation about evolution this weekend. And it was fun, actually, through somebody that actually works in the sciences and actually has a biology degree. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just waiting, waiting for the point of the question. Okay, okay, so but the actual question I was asking um, is actually kind of on topic in a way. Give me a second. Sorry about this. Yes, I'm on it. I'm fucking doing something. Tell Jesse I'm busy. I, I, I should have um, muted him at that point, I think. But oh, I go. do apologize about that. I do apologize. Um, yeah. Domestic now, violence um, is a terrible thing, but do carry on. Yes, okay. So... The um, So the question I actually had to ask is, there are lots of things, the only example I can think of right now is Pokemon, that doesn't have evolution in it, but it calls it evolution, and do you think that um, makes it harder to educate the public of what evolution really is, when they see something that, <laughs> that looks like what they think evolution is, but is not evolution in any shape, way, or form? Well, yeah, absolutely, especially when you've been raised since childhood to be given the wrong definitions of things. And we, we mentioned this before, when somebody is given a definition for what an ape is, and that definition is that it is a still-living, non-human, you know, still-living, the ape, definition for ape is a still-living, non-human ape in Africa. You, the definition already 
relates that it's it's a Freudian slip because it's all of them except for us, meaning that we are actually part of that set. But being given the wrong definition is still going to confuse people. I mean, I was told when I was a kid that you know you had old world monkeys and then you had baboons and baboons were not monkeys. Why did they say that baboons were not monkeys? Because they had an arbitrary decision about what a monkey was. And they thought that uh, monkeys would be living in trees and that the baboons live on the ground not in trees so they don't qualify as monkeys. They don't provide a definition here. It's very, it's, this is why it's critical to have a definition for what the hell you're talking about. Especially if you're going to come up with something like, you know, uh, is evolution qualified as science or is, does this qualify as a transitional species? You know, if, if you're going to ask qualification questions, do we have to know what the qualifications are? Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest problems with the whole I, uh, the whole theory is a lot of people don't know what evolution is, and I, I had a friend of mine who uh, who is a uh, who is a young Earth uh, young Earth creationist, and he actually to disprove evolution, he was going to send me the trailer and said the trailer would do it for ev evolution versus God. Like he thought that would disprove evolution, and I tried to explain to him how how dishonest Ray Comfort was, and he told me, oh, every time I bring up these great creationists, you tell me they're dishonest. Uh, I'm sorry, that's who you're working with. Um, <laughs> I, I have a brief question, actually. Has anyone actually seen this evolution versus God thing? I've seen a piece of it. It's the same as what he does before. He, he asks the least qualified person he can and uses that answer as if that person speaks for the most qualified person. So, so he had but, but, his, I mean, okay. Keep in this last video, for example, he did an interview with uh, PZ Myers, but mm -hmm. he also interviews college students, and he the way that he phrases the questions, there's so much, there's nothing is defined. We could be talking about multiple things. There could be different implications that they're talking about, and then when he starts talking to random students who don't really know the argument very well, the way that he's got it spliced together is that it doesn't matter that he was just talking to a professor of biology a minute ago. He's now talking to a student of electronics who doesn't know anything, and that, that person's answer now conveys, apparently, for everybody else that was in the video. And if and, you watch the trailer, the only people you see are actual, like, uh, who actually have doctorates in biology. But when you actually see the video, those aren't the people giving the good answers, and it's and and the other thing that's dishonest is that if you were to talk to somebody long enough, like for you instance, uh, Aaron, if 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 a creationist was to talk to you long enough, he could splice things that you say and make you say things you didn't say, like like Eric Coven did recently. Yeah. Yeah. It's, what he what he did with we in the case of my wife, for example. When he asked her, uh, do, you, "Do you?" and it's a per it was a pretty straightforward question, and said, "Would you say that truth is whatever is concordant with reality?" She could have answered that question, yes, but she said, "But there are some things that you know." She said, "I don't know if truth equals real because there are also opinions that are truthful, but wouldn't be objectively verifiable." And so, of course, he he cuts that out. And then so she doesn't know if truth equals real. I'm a science teacher. That's that's the way the sentence is spliced together. So scientists don't know what's real and what isn't. Is Actually, the, to, is to, the to be honest, I, 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 I watched that video and I found the the chopping around made it almost nonsensical. I mean, you might be able to pull that out. But, I mean, it, it seems to be chopped around so much that, um, yeah, you know, it was actually sort of, Difficult to follow what the hell was going on. I mean, it's you know, you just take a load of random sentence fragments and stick them together. It was it sort of lacked a um, cohesiveness. And yeah, I mean, let me ask you another question: How many people do you think that will convince? But well, no, nobody that isn't already convinced of their preferred conclusion. Well, and, and I all get, and I actually agree with R and Ra. I, I I think what it's going to do is it's going to have people like my friend who already thinks it's correct, um, and it's just going to enforce them. Like he told me, this is the video, this is evidence, um, for it. And uh, for instance, debates. You could have the greatest debate against two people that know their position. A debate's not to convince people; it's for entertainment purposes. It's it. 
Um, if you want to learn something, go watch a lecture by somebody who has a, who has a, who has a degree in what you want to know about. Um, yeah, now that's a very good point, and I want to bring up something on that because when you talk about using a debate, it, 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 science obviously would not have two people get up on the stand and express their opinions, especially when they're both citing research that nobody has had prior access to and been able to peruse and understand before the guy gives his opinion about it. When you have an argument with a creationist, the creationist pulls up all this stuff that nobody has had a chance to see and if he, if he gets a scientist, if he gets an evolutionist, well that person is going to have a scientific speciality and if it is that that guy's specialty is in biology, then they're going to talk about cosmology instead. Or he's going to talk about everything else that he can talk to besides that and pull up all kinds of research nobody's going to have prior notice of and express what it says that when you do get a chance to look at it doesn't really say that at all. Uh, I had a similar discussion with uh, uh, Bob Enyart, Pastor Bob Enyart, Denver Bible Church, where he brings up all of these different citations, claims the validity and veracity of all of these that prove that they found all these original, non-decomposed biological material from fossils of dinosaurs. Right? Conclusive proof. Because this is the assertive way that they talk. But when we get into a written discussion, which I couldn't believe that he'd agreed to, we get a chance to review the documents and express what does it really say. And in not one instance of the citations he himself brought forward did it ever show any original non-decomposed biological material and certainly right. no blood cells such as he was claiming initially. Yeah, um, so just for everyone who's not seen that, because this is another one that comes up time and time again, is unfossilized um, dinosaur remains. And maybe you just give us a quick rundown on what the hell they're talking about. All right, well, in the claim that they, that they found blood, for example, that they want you to believe that there have been blood cells found. My statement was, before I had a chance to review this, I said that you might get um, you might get some breakdown products and some of the heavier elements like metals may remain because how are they going to be replaced in the fossilization process but otherwise you're not going to have non-decomposed original biological material and when it produces the findings and we can actually go through it the closest he got was he was able to say okay well they found heme one, stu one study found heme which is an iron based compound and I said and, and it was basically the breakdown products of blood mm -hmm. so it's exactly what I predicted it would say breakdown products thereof and it's iron based so the iron is still but there Okay. Uh, maybe the um, for me when I took a look into this, the thing that sort of stunned me most, and uh, you know, almost the entire creationist argument on all of these things is, hey, these are many millions of years old, um, so there can never be any uh, organic remains in these bones, right? And then you actually go and read the papers, and actually now that's exactly what they were going looking for. Um, that you get big, heavy bones, and for the stuff, you know, if you fossilize the outside, you've essentially got a time capsule. Um, yep. And so, yeah, it takes a very long time to fossilize the inside of the bones. So, yep. I, ironically, exactly what the creationist says this disproves is exactly the reason they were, yeah, they were going looking for organic breakdown products in the middle of big bones. Uh, and for the creationists to report this as, oh no, they can't be millions of years old, uh, is bollocks. You know, no, that's exactly what they were going looking for. Yeah. The, the, the thing about creationism that really upsets me is it's not about finding anything that's true. It's about looking for one little flaw in evolution. If they find something they think is a flaw, um, then they say evolution can't be true. I was... Uh, um, I actually mentioned to my uh, creationist friend um, that if um, that if we had the evidence, the scientists would be the people who would disprove evolution. It would not be a creationist. It would actually be a biologist who has a doctorate in it. Um, and he said if that happened, well, that that would that would lead cre uh, credence to creationism because all these scientists were saying this is true, and now it's been proven false. And I'm like, that's not how it works. The next theory come up would show its evidence and then we would base it based on that. But 
as you said earlier, there's way too much evidence for evolution, and if we did disprove it, the the new thing that would come up would be evolution, but uh, with with uh, with a slightly different uh, with slightly different things, because it's so demonstrable that we're not that it's not going to be completely overturned. Um, well, that's, this this person that we're still waiting for to show up. Well, let me, let me just update you, Warren. Yeah. I, I'm been having a uh, Skype um, exchange with him. Um, he uh, says that Google Plus is not working. Um, can he join by Skype? Uh, and please, um, Darren Langan, I will send you an email, a URL through Skype. Please stop calling me on Skype, otherwise I'll just remove you. Um, his latest uh, comment to me, um, Oh, they keep asking me to install a plugin, but it doesn't work. How can I use Firefox? Is there a link? Um, and he's not calling me on Skype. Um, I, is he is he putting the link into Firefox? I I don't know, Aaron. Um, he's calling me. Um, All right. I'm I'm going to try and figure out a way of whether I can actually get him on uh, a Skype call if that's the only way that he can talk to us. Um, but what I am going to do, because we've got a second caller who's been patiently waiting, I'm going to thank Mark very much um, for his contribution. Uh, thanks for the call. Um, but I am going to remove you now. And I Can think I give a really quick shout out pressing to this button. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're done. Um, <laughs> DPR is so rare really on that um, hammer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I can't, I've got to. Oh yes, um, Great Pirate is the next person to join us. Um, and whilst I, I have no idea what um, he would like to talk about, but hopefully he will be joining us soon. I've sent you a URL, uh, Great Great Pirate Solomon. Um, and whilst he joins us. I hopefully will be able to sort out with our friend from Pakistan whether we can actually get a Skype call. I, I suspect it's going to cause problems. Well, maybe it doesn't actually. I can just have him on a private Skype call and it'll, the audio will just feed through. Um, we can try that now, seeing as um, the great parrot doesn't want to join us. Um, let me see if I can. This could all work very badly, but who knows. I'm going to try and call him. Unplug my headset and see if he can actually talk to us. Hello, sir. One second. One second, please, because... Uh, okay. Could you start again? I had you uh, very turned down on the volume. Um, still struggling to hear you. So the problem is Google Plus is not working here perfectly. So uh, I need to participate via Skype. If that is okay with me. Can anyone hear what he's saying? Because I I'm struggling. I don't no, suppose anyone. It's too faint. Yeah. Can you turn up your volume? Or shout. All right. One or the other. Let me just check it's not my settings. At, uh, yeah, I've got them on high. I can put my microphone next to a speaker, but it's obviously a very bad contact. Oh, and he's gone. Oh, well. <laughs> we tried. We tried. Um, He's got the link. I, I, <coughs> I think he's still there. He's calling me now. Let's see if this improves things. Well, the call failed. Such is the... <laughs> the it wouldn't course. be the show if it went smooth. Absolutely. Um, and unfortunately, <coughs> given that the fact that we're doing it on Hangouts now, they automatically get... Um, updated onto YouTube without the ability to edit. So you, you see us warts and all these days. Um, Pirate may well be with us, though. Um, there we go. He's on. And I will see what I can do to get 
um, our friend from Pakistan. Are you with us, Go ahead, Pirate? Pirate. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. All right, well, uh, just wanted to say that, uh, first of all, I'm uh, big fans of all you guys. Um, been, uh, been watching your stuff for a couple of years now. Um, Thunderfoot was kind of my uh, gateway into the into the community and uh, th branched off from there and been following all you guys for a long time. Uh, big fan. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was um, something that uh, Aaron had kind of touched upon on the last show um, about, uh, you know, the sort of political situation in America um, with, uh, you know, you'd mentioned how the, um, you know, sort of the religious right and the sort of anti-science crowd has kind of things, you know, gerrymandered in a way that uh, it's kind of hard to get anything done because they have the money, they have the things set up the way they want. Um, and so, and it's also something that Concordance has kind of touched on in past episodes, um, you know, about how the uh, Dominionists tend to have a lot of money and, um, you know, they they can buy politicians pretty easily and uh, throw a lot of money towards campaigns and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's a problem that you guys have touched on and, you know, it's something that you know, whether it's, um, you know, trying to stick creationism in school or uh, denying climate change and things like that. Um, the way I've kind of been looking at it is, you know, no matter how much we do to sort of change hearts and minds and, you know, convince people of, you know, skeptical thought and things like that, as long as the moneyed interests are still controlling through that, you know, the money politics we might be kind of doing nothing, really. I mean, we might as well be doing nothing. So what I wanted to kind of talk about was the possible solution to that, um, which I don't know if you guys have been familiar with it at all, but uh, there's, you know, a couple different um, attempts out there for people to uh, have a new amendment added to the Constitution. Um, for basically uh, getting rid of corporate personhood and um, getting rid of the idea that uh, money equals free speech and limiting, you know, campaign donations and things like that. And I don't know how familiar you guys are with that, but there's a couple of different uh, movements out there. The biggest one, I think, is uh, Move to Amend. Um, they have a website, I think, move to and There's also uh, Wolfpack, which... I think I know Thunderfoot is a uh, a TYT viewer, so I'm sure he's familiar with that one. But I think yeah, uh, I, I'm, on their, I'm on their mailing list, so I am too. Yeah, and so I just kind of wanted to bring that up, um, maybe sort of bring it to attention, see what you guys think about it, and you know, with the uh, you know with the huge subscriber bases that you know you guys have combined, if maybe you uh, threw something out there about it. Um, maybe get some more attention to the issue, because I think that's really the thing that's going to prevent us from really moving forward with anything. I mean, as long as they're in control, you know, it doesn't matter if we get 90% of the population agreeing with us. I mean, it's not really going to do a lot of good. So that's just kind of what I wanted to bring up. Yeah, I'm actually a, a member of a number of uh, activist organizations, and I get uh, I get a, a lot of incoming emails for this. You know, it's like when the when the when the Koch brothers are trying to buy up yet another media outlet or what have you. And some things do get blocked, and there is some progress being made despite all the gerrymandering and everything. And again, it's you know it's the internet that so far has been you know has been aiding us in that. They've been trying to uh, censor and restrict and control that or, or monetize it in ways that would be prohibitive for its current purpose, but so far it's still a useful tool for, for activists. You know, I, I, I'm interested to know why you think corporate personhood is necessarily part of the creationist um, Effort, uh, you know, I, I I know that 
it's not like one particular group, you know, one particular group of Dominionists. The Koch brothers are very powerful, obviously. Uh, but it's like, you know, 60% of the country is, uh, you know, slightly more than half the country consider themselves conservatives or Republicans or whatever. I, I don't know that busting corporations is really necessarily going to have any impact on people's political views. What what do you think the impact would be? GPS. Well, I think um, I think as far as uh, you know, corporate personhood goes, I kind of a little bit more view that towards uh, the climate change denialist sort of aspect of it, as opposed to the creationist um, issue. I mean, I think there's probably some overlap, but I, I see that being more about uh, the problems that we have trying to get anything done with climate change and things like that. But um, there is a there, there is a brilliant bumper sticker on that concept that I'd like to make people aware of. It's the bumper sticker that I saw said, I'll believe corporations are people when Texas executes one. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that one too. Um, but the uh, the other thing is, I mean, my point was, you know, yes, right now there's still a lot of people who are conservative. There are a lot of people who, you know, 46% of the country or something like that are creationists to some extent. I mean, whether they're the hardline literalists or not is sort of up in the air. But um, my point is that, you know, if even if we do go and get, you know, that change, those numbers changed, as long as the people with the big bucks and the money are still being able to buy politicians and, you know, buy elections, what's really going to change doesn't matter what the public opinion is. Um, I, this Under, is before I come to you, because I always interrupt you, um, I've, I've got our friend from Pakistan <laughs> back on a Skype call, and the connection seems to be better than it was before. I'm going to try and get him on. Um, I do not know whether this will work or not. I'm going to have to unplug my headphones, and uh, hopefully he will be heard through my speakers. I don't know whether he's louder than he was before. He seems to be, certainly by the way he's punching his type, um, keyboard, but let's find out. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Faran. Yes, sir. Okay, you're loud. You're louder than you were before. I'm not sure whether people are still going to be able to hear you, though. Um, give it a go, and let's see where we get to. All right, sir. Yeah, you, you've got the floor. What have you got for us? Well, sir, basically, uh, we need to start with the process of evolution. Okay, and let me let me just pause you there. Can I just ask, can people hear what he's saying? Uh, he said we need to start with the process of evolution. Okay, so people can hear what you're saying. Okay. Back to you, Farhan. Uh, sir, they can't hear me? Yeah, they can hear you. I was just checking that they okay. can hear you. They can. Can you perhaps um, speak slowly? I don't mean that in a patronizing way. It's just the contact and the connection is not that good. If you speak slowly, I think people will be able to hear what you're saying. All right, sir. I'll try on the Well, sir, as the thing goes. Hello? Hello. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Sir, as the thing goes, I have been having quite a lot of debate with the issues lately regarding the process of evolution. The concept which I mostly get from them is that the apes are basically responsible for the birth of humans, which seems like quite it's different for a lot of people for me. Right, let's, let's, let's pause that. You're saying, um, in case anyone didn't hear, you're saying that from your understanding, the apes are the... Sorry, just say that again. I don't want to misquote you. Human. The apes are the basis of the evolutionary process that led to humans, yes? Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Right. And do you have a, do you have a problem with that, or is there a question that follows on from that? Uh, I'm sorry. The call the call's breaking up so badly. 
I don't know whether anyone else can understand what's being said. I can't. Mm. I yeah. think we're going to have to leave this to another occasion, uh, Farhan. I don't. I, honestly, I, unless the contact, the connection gets better very quickly, we literally can't hear what you're saying. No. Um, we will try again on a future occasion, but I'm sorry, it, it, I, it was not working for me. I couldn't hear a word. So. Uh, yeah. I was getting about every third syllable, which is yeah. well, actually yeah. probably every sixth, I think, is probably more accurate. Yeah. Uh, well, um, he, he certainly seems eager to talk to us, so hopefully um, we will be able to get him on, on to a future show. I'm sorry that we can't do it now, um, but there we are. Uh, don't uh, say that we don't try. Let's get back on topic then. What we're, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, I interrupted right, you. So I you? was, uh, yeah, you. Um, Not for the first time, I interrupted you. Thank you. Uh, now with the corporate. Person, Not for the last time. Okay. <laughs> okay. We, we we've got the joke now, DPR. <laughs> right. With the uh, one of the big problems with the American politics is there's just too much money in it, um, and this leads to a sort of positive feedback and. Yeah, the easiest way to explain this is either with the industries associated with the military or with healthcare. Um, in both cases, there are about a trillion dollar industry. Um, you know, so that's a thousand billion dollars. So um, that means that if you wanted to increase, say, the military budget by just one percent or point one percent. Um, that uh, you know, you wanted to increase the military spending by a billion dollars, then if you were to spend basically a billion dollars of your current budget, that's one part in a thousand of your budget, to lobby Washington to spend that one part in a thousand extra on the military budget, then that's a null proposition for you. That that means that uh, it, it's not really cost you anything, um, and. You know, you take a look at that, a billion dollars divided by, what, 500 people in Congress or something? That's $2 million a piece for lobbying each member of Congress for a one part in a thousand increase in the military budget. So you can see that these are really quite powerful feedback forces. Yeah, you know, you know, obviously, I don't mean that it's explicitly set out in those lines, but macroscopically, that's how it works. Is that you know, you you if you've got a big industry like, for instance, the healthcare industry or the health insurance industry, they can put huge financial pressures onto Washington. And that's what you really want to um, avoid, um, or you want to diminish it. I, I think in America that has become too big a factor, and you want more of the democracy in there and less of people um, with big industries being able to influence the government for their own benefit. Um, so yeah, I agree completely that there need to be some extra mechanisms in there. Um, I'm not quite sure which would work. I mean, I've always thought the best uh, solution is maybe let the South secede this time. And then <laughs> you, you, you halve the size of the financial... Yeah, if you now split the US government into two, you halve the financial pressure on them. But then we'd lose concordance and iron. <laughs> uh, well, okay, we, we can import the... Uh, um, we can we can uh, institute a brain drain on Texas. You know what what shocks me is that we've managed to politicize so many scientific questions that there are now political positions on things which are, you know, not matters of opinion. Whether or not the Earth is getting warmer is not something we can debate about. Now we can debate about why it's getting warmer, uh, but that's a scientific debate. It needs to be debated among scientists and not become a pawn in a political game. The same thing for evolution and creation. That should not be a political issue, and the fact that it is says something 
that is wrong about our, I don't know, maybe our brains, but our political structure. You know, these are basic scientific questions. Who wants to take a position against what is essentially scientific fact? It would be like debating, you know, the Republicans have a position that the value of pi is greater than 3.14, and the Democrats have a position that pi is less than 3.14. It's, it's, it's ludicrous, right? It should not be something that Congress debates. It should be something that the scientific community and, uh, amongst ourselves decides upon and then right, woe be unto anyone who, who stands against that, right? The scientific and community. It's one of the things that in America at the moment, um, uh, you, if you like, can have a degree of tolerance on that sort of thing because there isn't a fierce competition um, for those scientists. You know, that um, if they want to get well paid and you know live in a nice place, um, America is one of the few places you can do it. Um, however, if there were fierce competition with those scientists, they will likely go somewhere else. And you, uh, in the um, changing world, I think that America is going to be increasingly more hard pushed by its a lack of uh, the way that it's not engaged on these problems, by the way that it's let the pseudoscience like the creationism and the global warming denialism become essentially mainstream topics. There, there will be a price to be paid for this. Um, you know, to America, to to agree, America is lucky that it's not suffered more from this so far, but it's in the post, and it's an unsustainable long-term position. Well, the reason that these things have become mainstream topics is because, you know, to use Concordance's uh, analogy, there's a lot of money to be made by denying that pi is, or saying that pi is less than 3.14. I mean, as long as there's a lot of money to be made by saying that, oh, no, don't worry about climate change, we're not, you know, nothing's going on here. And of course, there is in the oil industry and things like that. So as long as there's a lot of yeah. money to be made, but the thing is happen. that, but in I mean, in, this is maybe the perfect example. And uh, what does this mean? Well, this means that uh, China, who isn't big on the global warming denial, and is much more a much more practical approach to this, has basically cleaned up when it comes to producing the generators for wind farms. And so now you get all these wind farms over America made with uh, Chinese generators. You basically, it's cost you an entire manufacturing industry um, because of the influence that the oil lobby has in Washington. Those wind farms could have been made in America. And just for the record, it's not just the Republicans who hold anti-science viewpoints, something oh, like anti-GMO, right? Yeah. Uh, Anti-vaccine, a lot of those people are the sort of green, you know, hippie, anti-various things, you know, these civil libertarians, some of them go so far over the line that they become denialists in their own way, uh, yeah, you know, I... supporting things like teach the controversy. We, it's not necessarily split along a particular line. The fact is it has become... Uh, a you know a, a game that they're playing. I win, you win. It scores points for me. It scores points for you. It's a shame that that's the way it's been. We can't just have objective, apolitical, scientific knowledge pushed out there. It all has to be part of the volleyball that they're playing. Yeah, I hear you. I uh, you know I've, I've taken part. Uh, I've been to you know a few Occupy rallies and things like that, and I uh, I have to school some of my fellow uh, protesters there, you know, and they're going on about GMOs. I'm like, yeah, look, Monsanto sucks. Like, I hate Monsanto, but there's nothing inherently wrong with GMOs. I mean, there could be problems with them down the road, which is why we shouldn't have blanket immunity to. To Monsanto and other companies like that for lawsuits and you know stuff, stuff like that, but inherently, I mean, it's no, it's really not a whole lot different than 
you know, the way we've been modifying these plants and vegetables all along, just we're using a more advanced technology to do it. And there's, and I've had, you know, the same thing with vaccines, like, it's, you know, and <laughs> they always bring up, like, all these crazy, you know, they, when they get into a debate, you know, they cite, like, Mercola.com, you know, like, all these homeopath, uh, you know, things like that, and I'm like, yeah, that's not science. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. So the thing is, there's money to be had on every side of every debate. That's what I've come to realize. You know, my company does GMO testing. We, we actually, we, we don't do the GMO testing. We make the equipment that is used by companies that test for GMOs prior to their being imported into Europe, where this, the, the laws are very strict for import requirements. So there's a multi-billion dollar testing industry. You know, likewise, the, the vitamins and supplements and, you know, basically alternative medicine is a multi-billion dollar industry. And, of course, the pharmaceutical companies are a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar company uh, or industry. So, you know, <laughs> it's very easy, basically. Whoever's taken bribes from the alt-med people are pro-alt-med. Whoever's taken bribes from the pharmaceutical companies. But to say that one side is evil and the other is not, I think, is, again, it's part of that political volleyball, you know, tossing it back and forth to see who can score the point. No, I, I, I really I wish science could be detached from that and that scientists were a little bit more objective and apolitical about these things and that we had some sort of a, you know, advisory committee that we could trust to give us solid answers on the science. Most of the time you can go to the literature and after, you know, s sort of surveying a couple hundred papers, you can get a sense of which direction the the, the facts and the evidence basically point but it's not as easy as picking one paper you know each side can can scavenge up a few papers uh, usually paid for by some industry uh, yeah. sponsor you know even science can be tainted but you can't no one can afford to, to bribe all the scientists in all the world all the time and I think this is where you know we as scientists um, you know, really have disdain for the people who drive this stuff on political grounds. Because in science, we're interested in the truth. We're not interested in sort of cherry picking, um, you know, the the scientific literature for papers that you know cast doubt on this or this. We want to know what is what is correct. And if we if we don't, what experiments can we do that would decide which of these you know models, if any, is correct? Um, and all of that sort of seems to go out the window when these people are politically motivated. So they're just looking for essentially confirmational bias. And if you can cite a scientific paper. That's just the, the veneer of credibility. Yeah, I don't really care about any of the details. Yeah, it's true of religious motivations as well. I, you know, it's so common to see someone like the uh, is it the Templeton Foundation, um, which yeah. funds research. I mean, that's sort of a religious industry uh, sponsor, or the Koch brothers sponsoring the Discovery Institute. Uh, you know the Templeton Prize being given out to scientists who are willing to say something nice about religion uh, in order to further that particular agenda. That's the kind of thing that it does actually worry me that that you know money is an enticement for anybody, uh, and certainly a scientist who is making fifty five, sixty thousand dollars a year uh, with a you know, ten years of education and and twenty years of experience. That's a it's a nice enticement to say, hey, I could win a million dollars and get a nice prize and be patted on the head all the time and be invited out as a speaker. And so the corrupting influence is definitely there. Um, but it would be it would be good if there were some sort of science council uh, where we sniff out those people who are obviously in the pay of one industry or the other. Yeah, I agree. Uh, James, I... Before, before we move on, I, there's a question that appeared in the YouTube chat, and I'd like you to address it. Um, it says that you have got a very uh, nice noise... Uh, sorry, let's get it right. 
a, a sexy noise reductor on your microphone. Perhaps you could explain exactly what's going on there. This? This is what we're talking about. This is a uh, cheesecloth wrapped with a, um, a bread tie. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, when I'm outside, there's a lot of wind noise, and so R and Raw actually came up with much more innovative uh, wind socks. But this is the best I could come up with. I know it looks like I'm, I'm nursing a tooth or something, but yeah, that's a uh, cheesecloth. I actually used it to make cheese, for the record. Not not this cloth, but that's why I had the roll of cheesecloth. But believe it or not, the microphone that I used in my Foundational Falsehood series was like a $5 microphone I think mm -hmm. I picked up at Walmart and it, the, what I used as a noise reductor was the, it, the finger of a child's cloth glove that was fitted over the end of it and held on with electrical tape. Wait, wait, surprised. you cut a child's finger off just to make a microphone? <laughs> That's hard. Yeah, you I, atheists. I, 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 yeah, just just tell me that you took the finger out of the glove first. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. It makes yeah, better sound producer. Yeah, guys, I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to jump out. I have another appointment that I have to make, and I'm sorry that I have to cut out a little bit early today. But it's uh, it's been fun as always. Judas. Ah. Judas. <laughs> What can we say? Uh, Owen, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. It's always uh, a pleasure to uh, have you on the show. Uh, right, take thank care. you, sir. And actually, I, I'll tell you what I, c I can do. Oh, God, has he gone? No, hang on. I can... Oh, no, I can't. I can't kick him because he's gone. I was going to kick him. I was going to do it. <laughs> You're done. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I know it's sort of like cut in through a, what was obviously a very interesting um, conversation, but... Um, I've got another caller lined up as well, but um, can I just I ask do, uh, one uh, more I, question before I go? Yes, one of course quick, you can. Um, well, you yeah, you go first, um, and then I'll raise what I'm going to raise, and then we'll get uh, the next caller in. I was just curious if you guys had ever thought about um, you know inviting instead of like you know you a lot of times try to get creationists and stuff on here to debate with. Have you ever thought of like maybe getting a, a homeopath or some other kind of weird pseudoscientist to Get on here yeah. and debate. Yeah. I'd love to. Um, I would we, love we, to. We, you know, the only one I won't, I will not have on the show, if you don't mind, DPR, is John Bennett because he is he is a great big bag of nuts. Hmm. We don't want him. I mean, it, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? I mean, we we get criticized on occasions because we have um, invited creationists on um, Samuel and um, I can't remember his father. Rolf. Name was. Rolf Lampa. Rolf Lampa, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that we had painful. those on. Um, yeah, it was and, painful. Yeah. And we got a lot of criticism from people saying, why are you giving these nut jobs uh, any airtime? Um, we've sent invitations to the likes of William Lane Craig, um, Ken Ham, um, who else? Well, we've had That's Eric and can, uh... Si on the show. But uh, my point is, just quick, very quickly, Thunder, my point is when we do get these people on, if we can actually get them on, um, we get criticized for doing it. So I don't know what the audience really wants. Do they want us to get these people on, or would they rather us not give them any airtime? I don't know. Thunder. Uh, yeah, Ken Ham. Um, Aaron seems to have gotten under his skin and onto his radar that if we were to actually uh, try and get him on again, it's possible that they might. Yeah, or at least, you know, I mean, uh, so I've seen a video on Ken Ham's Creation Museum channel that actually had Aaron's wife and also on Eric Hoven's thing, and they basically discussed it as well. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's possible we could get Ken Ham, Ken Ham on. And I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to send out these invitations. All I'm saying yeah. is I've, I've certainly previously sent one to Ken Ham. Uh, and he's uh, not even responded. Yeah. I mean, obviously, he, he we're not gonna <laughs> we're not gonna make a dent in Ken Ham because his whole living is based on believing the things that he believes and Actually, not backing down. Um, I came across a hilarious segment. Uh, there was an interview with Ken Ham, and he basically describes how they did all this. Uh, these studies, and they found out that uh, 
forty percent of America or something would visit a creation museum if they built an ark. And so they took a step of faith in the Lord sort of thing. And it's like, bollocks did you take a step of the faith with the Lord? You did market research on to whether this was a viable proposition or not. Yeah. You're not trusting yeah. in God. You're trusting in market research. You're trusting in the Pew Research Foundation. Yeah. yeah. It's like... Do you know, Thunder, you forgot something in your recent video. Uh, I know you talked about you know shooting animals with volcanoes, but what you didn't consider, and I, I hope you're waiting for it, the, oh, yeah. the sparrows could have could have <laughs> picked up the animals. Uh, 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 are we talking the, the African, African swallow or the European, or the European? No, 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 no. They couldn't because let's not forget. There were only two of them. They were yes, they were clean animals, so there were only two of them. Right. No, sorry. No, if clean. There would have been seven. Seven or fourteen. Yeah. Yeah, seven it or would, fourteen. It would take. It would take quite a lot for even seven sparrows to carry a kangaroo. Um, well, the two of them could six, could six thousand miles. They were, bear in mind, they were baby twice. kangaroos. They were baby kangaroos, and they were genetically much purer back then because this was <laughs> only shortly after the fall. I came, uh, this was another Ken Ham video I came across where he basically directly says that, um, you know, who was Cain's wife, and he says it was his sister. Right. And it's like, uh, on the argument is, oh, well, people were genetically pure then, so it didn't matter. And it's like, dude, you're advocating incest. And it's like, this is... Where, where yeah, there's, in the there's Bible, no excuse for it. No, where in the Bible, I defy you to tell me, where in the Bible does it say that incest is wrong? Apparently, there are places, according to Ken Ham, there are places, but I don't know whether it is, where it is. I mean, um, if you think about it, after Lot. Um, yeah, sleeps with both of his daughters. He, he impregnates his daughter. As well. Although, no, it, 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 it should RP. be noted. It should be noted that they get him drunk first, so they can. In fact, I, I would love to see um, the uh, the modern social justice warriors discuss whether that classed as rape or not. Mm. Because they got they got Lot so drunk that he could sleep with his own daughters. So does that so count there, as consensual I, I, from, sex? From my own, Wait, from my own personal experience, I think that I can say that there is a narrow dividing line between getting someone so drunk that they don't know what they're doing, and even more drunk that they can't actually procreate. Oh, let's not get on that topic. Let's not <laughs> start down that line. But uh, DPR, it's Leviticus 18.8 mm -hmm. through 18, but it's 8 mostly. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Apparently not your father's wife. Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's blah, blah, blah. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, yada, yada. It keeps going, but it's all these do not it does, dishonor, it do does, not have sexual I, relations. The, 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 I, I agree with you, but um, if you actually look at it in detail, and I, it's a long time since I have done, um, there are certain relationships where it doesn't prohibit oh. <laughs> uh, sex. Um, well, I which, think father-daughter was mentioned. Are, are, Current law would still <laughs> be defined as incest, but who's to say? Um, Actually, that's a good one. Yeah, nowhere in the Bible says that it can't. You can't marry your donkey. Uh, no, it kind of does. Uh, if you lie with an animal. Um, no, it's again, that, well, that's, that's fine. Good. You can't have sex with the donkey, but it doesn't say you can't marry it. Well, thank God. Yeah, hallelujah. Praise, praise a good Lord for that. Um, uh, great pirate! Thank you very much indeed for the call. Uh, Thank you, guys. Great work. Because Thank you. I've, I've lost the power to kick people. What's going on here? Uh, oh, even anyway, gods have their off I'm days. Gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to invite you, great pirate, to the honourable thing and um, lie on your sword, so to speak, and remove yourself. Um, otherwise. I guess I, uh, there's nothing I can do at the moment. Um, oh, he's done the kind of thing. Um, one of the things I just wanted to uh, raise before I bring in the next, um, probably, uh, final caller is that uh, I think I've mentioned before, I um, have a Twitter account. Indeed, you can follow us um, 
on the Magic Summit show at the DPR Jones. Uh, links will be in the description, etc. But one of the people, I didn't follow that many people, but one of the people I follow is the Pope. The Pope does indeed have a <laughs> well, you, Twitter you, account. You, you, you've got to keep up with what God's thinking. But honestly, I swear, it, the, the tweets that come out of the Vatican have got to be the most banal, boring stuff. I mean, obviously, he's only got 160 characters or whatever. This is the last tweet that the Pope um, posted 10 hours ago. It reads, Don't be afraid to ask God for forgiveness. He never tires of forgiving us. God is pure mercy. Really? He's pure mercy, so he's nothing but mercy. So except he's not, when he's not. Hang right? on except when he's hang on. What's, exacting what's his vengefulness. Thing? What's the first thing that struck in my mind? Hang on a second. He's sending people to hell. But he right. is, according to the current Pope, pure mercy. Well, what about all the hurricanes he sends for idolatry and homosexuality? My right? God, wasn't very I've worked it out, guys. Merciful. Did you did you say that God is pure mercy? <laughs> Wait, chocolate. what is this? It's chocolate. Chocolate. It's, oh, it, it's, Ooh, I, I think chocolate. it's it's German chocolate made in. No, it's yeah, it's German chocolate with a French name. I don't know, this religion thing's starting to sound good again. Yeah, no, God's made a pure chocolate. The Catholic Church says as much. I have hopefully just sent a URL to someone that will be joining us soon. Um, I apologize that I noticed that there is some sort of lag between um, what we're actually doing live and what appears yeah, on yeah. either live stream or YouTube. It's not actually as, as significant as I thought it was, but uh, forgive us if we don't actually address all the comments that are being made um, as they come up. Um, but there we go. Hopefully, uh, we've been joined. I've got to press this button. We'll make him live. Is this Nephilim Free Sun? Look at the size of those headphones. We can't hear you at the moment. He's a very serious looking young man. Yeah, he's talking sincerely, but unfortunately, we can't hear a word you're saying. Um, if you go to the top right-hand corner, uh, you'll see a little circle, which is settings. Click can can you hear me? Now we can. There we go. Hello? Hi. What have you got for us? You can hear me? Yeah. Hello? Not yet. I'm just um, we can hear you. Well, I, was, I just wanted to, to comment on the uh, connection that I saw between something you said earlier and the discussion you had about um, politics later. So the the scientific illiteracy and the inability to have a conversation with some people who don't. Can you hear me? Because this is repeating. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you, just might, to, you just want to, to mute. Yeah, you just want to mute um, on YouTube or whatever. Watching on the you, hangout. And, you, there'll be a lag of about almost thirty seconds, or even maybe a minute. Yeah. Or put, well, you, I was going to say put just headphones in, but uh, hey, <laughs> you look like Neffy, so you've obviously got headphones. Hello. But we we can hear you. Yes. Hi. Uh, I think I think the problem was I had you open two instances because I clicked on the link and it uh, reopened the. Uh, so there we go. We can um, hear you perfectly. Do carry on. You, you said earlier that the um, that there's a problem with talking to people um, who basically don't have any kind of background in science, that have um, you know no uh, basic understanding in education in science, and you said later that. Um, you know, we have this massive problem with the politicization of science and uh, positions in science being political platforms. But it seems that we there there these two things are part of the same issue. You know, mm -hmm. we, we get people who are educated uh, 
very poorly in science, and they go on to become either members of the general public or do humanities degrees and become politicians. And so then the politicians who have no understanding of science um, are elected to office and fail to address the problems that we have with a science education in society. Perfect. And as a result, you know, it becomes a self-perpetuating loop. Feedback. Yeah. yeah, I agree with um, that. And I think Carl so Sagan... it seems to me that the, one of the most important things that we can do as a movement is, is to campaign on issues of science education. Mm -hmm. I agree. And um, in, increasing the, um, the the focus of science in politics. There, there is so much inertia that. We would have to come. We will. We'll. We'll have to combat, yep. and that is each generation is holding back the generation after it. You know, we're getting them in the public schools to talk about scientific literacy and scientific education, but then they're going home to parents who fear science or oppose scientific viewpoints based on their political leanings. So we're going to have to overcome such a fundamental nature of, of humanity that we we fear change, we fear things we don't understand. We have to jump that hurdle and no one has really proposed a successful mechanism to change that. The, the one thing I, I see that has made a bit of an impact is the way technology has integrated itself into our daily lives you know, it's very hard to deny, like the iPad and the iPhone, internet communication, that those things are very real. They're very much part of our lives. If someone were to deny those types of things, you know, the safety of Wi-Fi, for example, uh, they would well, face well, a lot stiffer opposition. Well, if that's true. Um, to an extent, that the 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 the, ex the extent to which this technology has developed, it's it's become magic. You know, it's mm -hmm. magic in a black box. You're right. You can't take it apart and fix it yourself anymore. So, the in a way that doesn't help for the public understanding of science because uh, all all they see is the the nice GUI, the nice on um, wrapping on the outside. They don't see the nitty gritty of how it works, or the hard work that goes into creating these devices. So it's a uh, you know. I, I'm trying to think of something Dawkins said. Uh, two types of science: you have the um, what is it, the like the landing a man on the moon, and you've got the uh, the frying pans and something. Oh, yeah. Talking about the applications the of technology, pan. Teflon frying pans mm -hmm. and microwaves, which were sort of the outgrowth of the basic research into the space program. You know, we talk about what what did. NASA accomplished during the 60s and 70s. And some people will say, you know, advancing humanity, you know, advancing our knowledge of the universe. And some people will say we develop microwaves and frying pans, you know, nonstick frying pans. Those are sort of the two arms of it. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to get at is when people tangibly live their lives a little bit differently as a result of the fruits of science, these applications of basic research, then we get to bring more people into this sort of pro-science fold. But you're right, too. It, a lot of times they are so far removed from the application of the knowledge that was required to develop that thing that we've not moved forward at all. I would, of course, much rather be the type of science proponent that talks about the advancement of knowledge for its own sake. You know, knowing more about the universe is good for us in so many ways. Um, but I'll pass it to Thunder. And, Go ahead. and of course, the, the space race led to an enormous increase in public expenditure in the U.S. Mm -hmm. on, on education. education, which, yep. you know, left us with a whole generation of great scientists. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need that kind of impetus again. We need uh, governments to appreciate the value of science. It's a, it's a broad cultural problem that we have to find a way of addressing if our civilization is to survive. It has to be at the very center of our government, our politics, because without right. science, we are paralyzed in terms of decision making, we have no means of making good decisions without science at the center one, of government. One, one thing I would chip in, if I may, is the the Curiosity mission to Mars. I think is absolutely mm. fascinating. It doesn't seem to have got grabbed the same attention as the Moon missions, presumably because it's not a man 
uh, there. But right. it's, it's mm -hmm. quite an awesome thing. And again, uh, going back to Twitter, yeah. um, you can actually get tweets from Curiosity, Curiosity. as it rubs around yeah. uh, Mars. It's just phenomenal. So if, what, what more encouragement do people need um, to investigate into these things? So this, this absolute wonder that there is out, out there rather than just sort of like saying, oh, well, no, I know everything because I read it in a book. Well, um, Sagan had a, a few really quite devastating quotes on this. I've got them in front of me. Uh, we live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. And his second mm -hmm. quote, which is, we've arranged things that such that almost no one understands science and technology. This is a prescription for disaster. We might get away with it for a while, but sooner or later, this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our faces. As soon as you read that, the image that yeah. immediately entered my head was Sarah Palin. <laughs> yeah, I can go over the new finger on the button. Yeah, yeah, I, and I, I think I said this last week. You know, <laughs> oh. what a way for mankind to end. You know, Sarah Palin. Uh, sat in front of a big red button thinking, I wonder whether it works. <laughs> or if you like, you can picture uh, the fact that we've taken a global network that involves fiber optics and space-based uh, signal communications, and we use it to broadcast pictures of whatever dinner we're having at the time with these cool filters on it. You know, that's what people do with technology. The first wave, it's always, you know, research and uh, high-tech and military applications. And the, <laughs> the second wave is we're using it in our daily lives, like microwaves, right? You know, the initial applications were for very specific right types of, you know, radar-type applications. And now we use oh. it to reheat yesterday's pizza. So, I, I don't you, know. Have it, you ever it's done a, the uh, work out the speed of light with cheese on toast in a microwave? It's a challenge, but yeah, I'm up for it. <laughs> yeah. It's quite a fun one. Yeah. Because you have the, the frequency on the back, and you can get the wavelength from measuring the distance between the heat spots. You have to take out yeah. the rotator. But, right. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I know in my field, you know, in molecular biology, we're starting to see people play around. And I'm not too thrilled with the idea, but these sort of... Um, garage lab hackers, biohackers, who mm. are gene editing and and um, transforming, I have to put the right term, but they're splicing I mean, that's, that's, in genes from other organisms I'm, to do I'm things as trivial as, you know, painting a picture with bioluminescent bacteria or, um, you know, and, and then there are real applications that, you know, really need to be done. So I don't know, maybe, maybe we're at the start of a new industry of... But the, garage you know, the, 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 the the garage hack the garage biohacking or oh, however mm. you call it is it's it's like the personal computers revolution in the eighties. Mm -hmm. you know, it's you, know, you give programming really takes off when you give people basic tools to go around and play with it. Of course, it can be potentially dangerous when you're dealing with microorganisms, but I, I suspect it will lead to a technological revolution in that field. Or a horrible disaster. Or a horrible disaster. <laughs> or, or both. Yeah, or both. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or zombie. The zombie apocalypse. <laughs> which I'm prepared for. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, pertinent at this moment to bring up a quote from Professor Farnsworth of, oh, everyone's <laughs> in favor of preserving Hitler's brain, but when you put it in the body of a great white shark, all of a sudden, no, you've gone too far. <laughs> 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 no. Not really a second too Hitler shark. Uh, in a shark nado. Did you all catch that film where there's uh, sharks coming out? Yeah. I saw a fragment, and it's like, uh, so this this is where um, the apex of technology has brought us. Yeah. So if, um, I note I note the time. I note that we don't have any more callers. Um, but thank you very much, uh, Richard, for your call. Uh, again, seeing as I seem to have lost um, the power to uh, boot people, I would invite you again, if I may, to throw yourself look, on your sword. I shall find a way out. Uh, please, yep. 
but please um, tell us where you got those headphones from before you go, because I've not seen a pair like that since I watched uh, the last Nephilim free video. Uh, the Logitech, I believe. Although this is this muffler thing is from um, another microphone. I just put it over there. Uh, That's uh, bizarre. Baby. When when Nephilim free started talking about the mufflers, I got really uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> let's just, so, oh, let, let, let me just give you one last quote from uh, Sagan which I think is again incredibly pertinent I'm often amazed at how much more the capability and enthusiasm for science there is among elementary school youngsters than among college students and I, I think that underlines the problem okay, as well it's, it's, again it's another great quote um, and it's it reminds me of something which I'm going to desperately misquote, and I can't remember who it came from, but um, at an elementary school or a primary school, you put a, um, in the, the, this shows how dated the quote is, you put a um, chalk uh, dot on a blackboard, and you ask the children, oh, we might have one last caller, uh, we'll see. But you put a dot on the blackboard and you ask children what it is and they come up with all sorts of wonderful imaginative answers. Um, you ask a 16, 18 year old um, what it is and they'll say it's a chalk dot on a blackboard. So something seems to be going on in the education process that <laughs> prohibits <laughs> imagination. It's the invisible woman with a painted nipple. <laughs> Come on, you well, said that's, you wanted that's something. Thanks for <laughs> illustrating the point, Thunder. <laughs> uh, Most of the great scientists that? retain that childish enthusiasm. Though. I mean, look about, look at Feynman. It's childishness. <laughs> we might have an extra call. Um, as I say, I shall leave. Call. Uh, 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 thank you very much for having we'll me. We'll see whether this person is going to join us. Um, if not, we'll be ending the show sh soon. But there is something that um, I want to mention. Um, it's with some regret that I have to announce that the charity event that um, we normally hold for MSF Doctors Without Borders um, is going to have to be postponed uh, this year. Yeah, I did have every intention to run it over the weekend of the 14th or 15th and 15th of September. Unfortunately, um, unlike someone whose name we cannot mention. Uh, I do actually have a dissertation that has to be completed by the end of the month, and it's um, it's actually taking a great deal more time than I thought it was going to. Um, so what I propose to do is to put it back probably to middle of November. But that said, um, but there are certain people that I had already got lined up for it, and I think it's an opportunity that should not be wasted. I have got Potholer 54. And if you're not familiar Yay. with them, shame on you. Shame on you. Potola 54. I have Eugenie Scott. And if you don't know her, again, Yay. shame on you. And also uh, Professor Philip Moriarty from Nottingham University Physics Department, uh, all of whom have managed to set this up, because I did actually start planning this some months ago. They've all agreed and have got a time fixed over that weekend. It's going to be about 4 o'clock in the morning for me uh, on Sunday the 15th. Um, but um, that is definitely going to take place. It'll be That section will be 90 minutes and we will be playing, similar to last year when we had Potholer and Eugenie Scott uh, playing, Would I Lie to You? Uh, if you're not familiar with it, I'll put a link into the description. Also, um, we've got um, the Skeptic Fence, who are going to do an hour before that hour, um, that's run by Live Life 8072, and I'll probably get a couple of people either side of that. So just to keep your wet your appetite, so to speak, over that weekend, uh, the probably be a four or five hour show. And also, I got this, and I'm so excited about it, I got this in the post the other day, and this is. I have to thank Rationalizer for this. So excited. Stephen Fry has donated an item that we will be putting on to eBay. It is signed. It is his uh, the, the Fry Chronicles 
And if I can find so, it. Uh, how did he get uh, I can find it? There's he's signed it and this will be up on eBay over that weekend. Also, well, I'll come to you a second, Thunder. Also, if you are watching on the um, live stream on the website, you'll see down the right hand side there are all the um, donation pages uh, that you can click on. You've got the picture and you've got the um, I think it's the uh, Just Giving. No, it's First Giving that is America and the Just Giving, which is United Kingdom, which will um, all go to Doctors Without Borders. But, as I say, unfortunately, um, the 24-hour event will have to take um, place probably, what I'm hoping for, is middle of November uh, rather than the... September, but there will be this four or five hour show um, in September. Thunder. Um, uh, yeah. Who knows Stephen Fry then? Like, how did he get I that? To, I have to thank uh, the Rationalizer for that. Um, he, he, he works behind the scenes and he does so um, almost demanding that he is not given any credit for it. Uh, mm. But he has managed to get all sorts of people lined up. He's got in contact with Stephen Fry's agent. Stephen Fry obviously was not prepared to appear on the show. It's not a great surprise. It would have been great if he had done. Um, but he, he sent uh, a book. And if there's any doubt about it, we can show all the emails that have been exchanged. This is genuinely signed by Stephen Fry. Uh, but that will be up for auction, as cool. I say, in, in well... What was it? Oh, God, oh concordance. Like concordance. Um, uh, your roots are showing. What? Uh, nothing. I didn't notice anything. No, 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 not me. Uh, uh, we've got one more, one more person that might want to join us. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to quickly read his uh Skype. Uh, I don't know. I've sent him a link. Um, if he doesn't join us shortly, we'll wrap things up. But uh, yeah. oh, you're playing. You're playing with Hangout tools. If I'll tell you what. No, 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 no. DDPR. You have to understand that sometimes technology can show people as they really are, rather than <laughs> as they want to be. Um, this is nothing to do with. Hallelujah! 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 Uh, no, nah, let's go back to something sensible. There we go. There's, there's, um, I can't remember. I'm trying to find it now. There's a little uh, <laughs> concordance sort of like, <laughs> thing. There's a random sort of like fruit machine at the bottom. Of but the thing is, it works on your thing. eyes. So, uh, there we go. Yeah, it's failed now. Um, but. There we are. I, I think we're joined by uh, our, our last, what will be our, our last caller. Um, right. DVR. So you see the horns have now detached, whereas if it can see both of my eyes, it gets them. So it needs to see, <laughs> it needs both eyes and... Uh... I imagine the mouth is probably quite important. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. It'll need your mouth as well. So... <laughs> no! No! Yeah, that is, and this, of course, uh, let me remind Art. you, is a is a serious educational uh, oh, program yeah. where we bring right. you. <laughs> I'll leave the eye patch on, though. Uh, hello. Uh, I don't know how. I'm, I'm so uh, totally sorry. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Emil. Emil. There we go. Yeah. Sorry. Um, well, um, it was the point that was uh, made earlier that. Uh, uh, there was a uh, well, there was a, a lacking sense of uh, of wanting to get uh, the knowledge uh, of, for instance, how uh, how uh, these basic machines work. For instance, for instance, a computer or something like that. That you, uh, you uh, that was what you talked about earlier, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that basically just uh, sparked something I, I recently saw. Uh, there's a, uh, a show I would like to uh, recommend uh, by, I, I think actually he's, he's a comedian, or he might be just be uh, a, pre a presenter. Uh, I forget what that word was. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, 
let's just say he's a comedian. Uh, he's made a show that's called uh, <laughs> laughing. He's made a show that's called uh, How TV Ruined Your Life. Uh, and I would basically suggest uh, that everyone who can, I think you can get it on YouTube. You can find it there illegally. <clears throat> And uh, uh, that episode is about progress and how uh, and how he sees that uh, the TV has kind of uh, I don't know tr tricked humanity out of uh, wanting to progress. And I think um, I, I think that's that's basically uh, a thing. Uh, yeah, I I could uh, I could play a devil's advocate for a little bit uh, for it because uh, he made some interesting arguments. For instance, if, if I don't even remember the show name, but uh, very long ago there was shows. Uh, there was when we were planning to get the, to the uh, the moon landing. Um, there was like these shows where you can where, where you could see all kinds of uh, new and interesting. Things that might happen in the future. Where you could, oh, we can get a robot that cleans your house and and takes your dog for a walk and and things like that. And you know, um, uh, some might say it's a little bit. Um, what what could we call it? It hasn't really happened yet that much uh, compared to what we expected would might have happened, and maybe that's why people are a little bit down on science. I, I, I was about to say a bad example maybe in that robotic vacuum cleaners are actually sort of quasi-mainstream. Yeah, I haven't seen much of them <laughs> myself. Emilio, though. you haven't seen the, the Roombas? I, I mean, have seen like, them. Yeah, they're, they're everywhere, and there are people that yeah. fight them against each other. We have robot you know, arena battles, they're just not, they're kind of a nerdy thing, right? Yeah. Um, but I mean, but I, I think your general um, statement is absolutely spot on, which is um, you take a look at, in fact, Concordance sort of made this point earlier, you take the apex of technology here, and what do people use it for? They use it to take pictures of their dinner and post it online. Um... Oh, I do that. I'm sorry. Well, well, okay, that's fine. <laughs> uh, that, that's no real problem. This is what sort of people choose to do with this technology. Fun and or games. Or you take you you take a look at what people choose to spend their time on, and it's things for the large part. It's things like reality TV. Um, yeah. And uh, it's yeah, sad. Let's let's, let's not sad. forget the elephant. The elephant in the room. It, uh, the, the majority of um, People using the internet and data using it for accessing pornography. Pornography? I they, there's pornography on the internet. That doesn't exist. You, you're lying, DPR. That's all Thunderfoot. I just I, want to point that out. I wish I had never given Thunderfoot. For, for, for those that don't understand, <laughs> I gave Thunderfoot the producer powers. Uh, and he somehow removed me, so I have I've no not control done over anything, anything anymore. DPR. He's using well, Google. Add me, as a, add, me, yeah. add me as a producer. All right. So what? What I want to I want to disagree. I can't, I can't control anything. I I, I put my hands. Up. I am not responsible right. for anything that happens to the rest so of this show. So if you look at Jules Verne, right? Jules Verne, and you know, way way back, Europe had its wide-eyed Perspective, um, how would you say, uh, optimistic phase, following you know onto that sort of Victorian Enlightenment uh, chain of events. I think probably it goes through cycles where people have these very positive viewpoints of what things are going to be, uh, and youth consume that culture and have these very optimistic viewpoints about what science and technology and culture have in store for them, right? Jules Verne predicted people, you know, being fired out of a cannon up to the moon uh, where they would go and have a picnic for the afternoon and then return, right? Would, would, would that be through Nephi's nozzle? <laughs> yeah, he would uh, bukkake them on up there. Uh, and then, you know, also in the 1950s, we had this very optimistic view of what 
future technologies would look like, and you get the Jetsons, and you get um, yep. you know Lost in Space kind of stuff. You know all this very high tech kind of stuff, and now the shows are a little bit more geared toward a dystopian type of viewpoint of you know how are we going to manage all the problems we're facing. But the same thing has happened cyclically, I think, throughout human history. Uh, and popular culture always likes to speculate about what will come next. You know, what kind of future predictions can we make? Again, Jules Verne being just a classic example. Philip K. Dick, a uh, classic example. Uh, the futurists, right? And then they alternate between these positive and negative. And, and the the previous generation always complain about the youth and their culture, right? And I think it's it's yeah. sort of part of that pattern. Now, the fact is the cycles are probably going to come a lot faster now because each generation has a lot more technology to adapt to and um, accept, right? There's faster pace of change. But I think that, in general, this principle of cycles of optimism and pessimism are probably par for the course. Yeah, I think I want to say, too, that uh, I think shows like this one right here kind of, you know, it does in inspire, you know, uh, even me to, to think how, how we can solve this problem. So it's like, you know, it's, it's a keystone. It's, it's like making sparks to do it, you know. It's, it's, it's going to blow up or... Hopefully, blow up. Yeah. Let's hope so. Um, I'm minded, if I may, to bring things to a conclusion. Um, we've overrun, as we normally do, this time by about 25 minutes. But um, would it be right if we can wrap it up there? Um, things to look forward to on the next show. Let's hope that we can get um, our friend from uh, Pakistan to actually join us uh, and to discuss issues of evolution. Um, and as I say, uh, look forward to um, the minor MSF Doctors Without Border event uh, on the weekend of the 14th, 15th of September. Uh, a, a full 24-hour show, hopefully, we'll be able to organize um, over the some weekend, probably in November. Um, but thank you very much indeed for everyone that's contributed, everyone that's watched. Uh, it's been great fun as ever. Uh, it's, it's one. The only thing that I was unhappy about is that uh, a video that Aaron posted recently, uh, which was entitled something like "Dealing with a Wasp's Nest," um, he came out in the most extraordinary attire. No, that's how he dresses uh, all the time, DPR. <laughs> well, I wanted to house. ask that's him what he looks this, like. I wanted to ask him whether this was some sort of like. Out that he kept in his closet for special occasions and wedding anniversaries or whatever. I don't know. Very odd video. If you haven't seen it, again, we'll include a, a link to that in the description. He looks scary. Scary. I mean, he looks scary in real life, but when he's dressed like that, whoa. Um, Mark, uh, sorry, Emmanuel, uh, thank you very much for the call. Can I invite you Emmanuel? to... Emmanuel, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's it's all right, Derpy I'm Jones. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go dyslexic. out and hunt dragons now. Bye. <laughs> um, thank you very much indeed. So thank you, everyone. Um, last words. Who wants to go first? Concordance, alphabetically. Uh, bye, folks. There we go. Later, Later guys. There we go. I'm not sure that I can actually end the broadcast. I think one of you two might have to do it. You see that big button that says end broadcast? Can one yeah. of you press that? And we'll I see you all in two weeks' time. I don't have a big red button that says end broadcast. <laughs>